Hey everybody, this is Rustin Rose with Metalholic Magazine and Examiner. And with us today, the legend himself, Carl Palmer from Emerson Lake and Palmer and Asia. And of course, if you remember that far back, even Atomic Rooster. How are you Hi. doing, brother? I'm doing well. How about you? I am doing absolutely wonderful. Glad we could catch up this morning. You yeah, guys, no problem at all. Looking forward to it. Now, you guys, Asia, we're talking about now, just released its 30th anniversary album. I don't know if you're calling it Triple X or 30. I was told XXX, so. Right. Yeah, I think we'll call it XXX. Triple, you can call it whatever you want. <laughs> as long as you call it good, right? <laughs> well, I don't mind. You can, you know, I don't mind. <laughs> so, um, I've only got a scant few minutes to talk to you, so I want to make the most of it. So, before we talk about what's going on with Asia, if if we can, for all the, the Carl Palmer fans back there, sure. let's let's back up a little bit. And I mean, you started way back in the '60s. I, you worked with, uh, you know, you did the the Crazy World of Arthur Brown, and and yeah. that led into Atomic Rooster, which you did one album with, and yeah. then of course the legendary Emerson Lake and Palmer. Can you take us back to, to those days and just sort of tell us about what was going on in your life then? And I mean, that's that's a whole lot of stuff to be happening so young in your 1968, life. 1968, um, there was the first hit single in America. The band was Crazy World of Arthur Brown. Arthur Brown, incidentally, is still alive and very, very well. And I was with him about um, two months ago. Um, I stayed with Arthur about... Uh, Stayed with Arthur's band, The Crazy World, for about 18 months, then left and formed my own group, my first group, which was the Atomic Rooster, which so happened uh, to have Vincent Crane, who wanted to come along, and he did. And uh, I put this band together with Vincent, and we then started looking for bass players. Obviously, the rest of that is kind of history. That went on to be a very successful underground sort of prog rock band here in Europe. And it was, I would think, around about 1970, I sort of got the call, 6970, uh, from Keith Emerson's manager in regard to forming a band with Keith Emerson and Greg Lake. Obviously, a lot of this has been documented anyway. I mean, we stayed together for a considerable length of time, nine years, disbanded for 12, got back together again uh, the beginning of the 90s, went through a, another eight years, and then we stopped again. Uh, for about 10 years, and the last time we played was in June 2010, 25th of June at the High Voltage Festival, which has obviously been recorded, it's been released, there was a DVD also. So between um, between 68 and now, I've been quite busy, I've now got my own group, the Carl Palmer Band, I've made three, four tours of America already, just finished 27 concerts with my group, um, we've got a DVD which I'm working on, I recorded the new Asia album at the beginning of this year, the Triple X, and we're on tour in September. We're playing a festival here in the UK called Wayfest, and then we take a, a week off and we get ready to go to Japan. Japan leads into uh, America for about six weeks, seven weeks, and America leads into Europe, and we finally finish up at the end of the year in December, around about the 22nd, playing here in London. Nice. So uh, most people are retiring at this point in their career, and you just keep on going and going and going. <laughs> so, well, you know, you only retire when you're doing something you don't enjoy doing. This I is mean, true. She only works six months of the year. We play together roughly five months throughout the world, and we spend a month, two months recording. So six, seven months we spend together. The rest of the time, we do our own thing. Like, as I said before, I work with my own band, which I've had for 10 years, actually, now, just over. And the other guys have all got other projects that they're involved in too, with, too. So I think we enjoy playing. I mean, we are a working band. We are working musicians, and uh, it's something that um, we can control how much we do each year, uh, whether it be Asia or whether it be the individual projects. And because of that, I think the enjoyment factor is a lot uh, is a lot higher because we're older, we know what we want to do, we know how to do it, and we designate the amount of time that it takes, and we all have fun that way, and freedom. Now, you guys sort of reunited again the original lineup of Asia at around the 25th anniversary year because you guys recorded the Live in Tokyo Fantasia album, 
But uh, Triple X is, is the third album back together yes. again as the quartet uh, with uh, Phoenix and Omega in there. And yes. now, but it's like a lot of people didn't really seem to under, realize you guys were back together, at least not here in the States. It wasn't until the Triple X album that a lot of people really started to take notice. And it's a, it's a wonderful album. And, and it, Thank you very much. It does without getting into the trying to push stuff to radio like I know Geffen was trying to force on you guys after the success of the first album. It does have a lot of radio-friendly sound, but it still has more of that, you know, that progressive element to it that you guys from the bands you all came from, yes, ELP and King Crimson and everything, it's got a lot of those elements as well. Um, I think, you know, I mean, you could be right there. I mean, it's not a progressive rock album. It's uh, an album full of tunes and things, and that's the way it is. Um, Asia, as you know, is full of progressive rock musicians. We've all got that pedigree, but we really are sort of more of um, a songs band. Um, I wouldn't say it's middle of the road, but it's not hard rock. It's not super soft rock, you know, and that's the, the path we've taken. The very beginning of the band was probably a little more experimental, I'm saying that, you know, on the last album, um, Omega, there were some prog rock tracks on that, and there were on Phoenix, and there were at the very start. So it's been with us. Probably on this new album, Triple X, they're really, they're basically all songs, and we've not really stretched out into that prog rock area, which is fine, you know. I think it's always good to move things around a bit and change. Yeah, and and again, it's it it reminds me a lot of the earlier stuff that you guys did. It it, it is very song oriented. I, I just hope that you know, fourteen million people agree with you. <laughs> well, and you guys had the number one album thirty years ago. I mean, that's to start at that apex is, is kind of a hard thing to to hold on to. Do you do you think that that had something to do with with you know Geffen pushing you guys so hard and the fact that you guys probably broke up too soon? I think, to be honest with you, it wasn't the fact Geffen was pushing too hard. I think what you have to realize, it was the beginning of this new explosion, this technology explosion. MTV was then MTV. It really was music TV. And that's where you could see the latest videos. You could see the latest bands. And we used that media to promote the band because we were in there from the get-go. Uh, Kevin Godley and Lowell Cream produced several of the videos for us and as far as we're concerned this you know was another art form and um, we used it and it helped the music obviously was real good because you can't um, you know you can't sort of make a great video if if the music's not working the music's not working and the music was good and the videos were good and the whole concept of that album really worked it seemed to marry up and uh, it got accepted and it was something which was probably more commercial than what we'd ever played before as individuals. But nevertheless, it all seemed to make sense. And as we say in the music business, the timing was right. Absolutely. I mean, it all collided into, as we said, the number one selling album of yeah. the year in 1982. So looking at the new album, it's a collection of songs. I know every song has a story. Are there any particular songs on this album that have a, a, an intriguing story or two behind them that you're willing to share? Um, I can't really tell you anything about the recording. I mean, obviously you can play the the songs and and you can read into the lyrics what you what you personally think. I, I didn't have any writing on this album at all, so you're better talking to the chaps that wrote the music, Jeff Downs, uh, John Wetton on this one. Um, I mean, we you know get together and we try and just pull the best music and play the best things that we possibly can, and that's how we put it together and. Um, these were the best tracks that we could come up with, and um, and that's fine. And I think they work well. You know, it remains to be seen how the public accept it. Um, the album was recorded, you know, individually. We don't record as a band. I go in and do various versions of drum parts, and then we finally select what uh, seems to be right. Uh, I can't really tell you any stories about any of the songs, as I say. Um, lyrically, they, they they all say something different, and... I think the individual can read into the song whatever it wants to. I just hope a lot of people um, get to hear the music and uh, understand, you know, what we're doing. Because basically, there are quite a lot of really good songs on there. And I think Face on the Bridge, you know, is uh, something which, uh, well, we will be playing in the set. We'll play a couple of tunes from this album in the set, as we will from Omega and Phoenix. 
and obviously will play a lot of the first album as well. So I think there's a, a lot of excitement in the stage show, and it is nice that we've now got three uh, new studio albums to, to draw from, and Triple X being the latest. Right. And, of course, you just mentioned the first single. You guys did the video for that. And correct me if I'm wrong, it seemed like the, the guys were together to record that, but they, they shot your portion of it separately? Um, you know, when we did, uh, we recorded, uh, everyone was shot separately when we made that um, um, video. And that's the way it was done. It was done as kind of a, a very kind of loose sort of type of thing. It wasn't meant to be any big production. And, uh, you know, I don't appear in it very often. I think you'll probably appear in it twice, very, very sort of short. So, I mean, that's just how we decided to do that. And that's fine, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, if the song's got legs and the song's going to uh, get through to people, uh, I don't think the, uh, the video will make much difference. It really is down to how good that song is. It so happens that um, the video is, is okay, you know. It just gets that point across that there they are, they're the original members, and you know, we're playing together, and that, I suppose that's all it can do, really. Well, that's funny, because it brings us back to, to a point we were talking about a minute ago, and, of course, Jeffrey Downs had this with the Buggles. They released that hit, um, Video Killed the Radio Star, and I think in many ways, and I don't know if you'd agree with me, but that's true. The, the MTV thing, it, it was wonderful for what it was when it first came out, but when you and I were growing up, we'd hear a song, and when we hear that song now, yeah, you know, when I go back and listen to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer songs, I think of that point in time, what I was doing in my life, and my memories are tied to that. Since the advent of MTV, when you when you hear the song, all you think of is the video. And that's true too, you know. But um, obviously, everyone's kind of different. I mean, I think of uh, a lot of the, the videos when I hear the music because they were that was another sort of art form then. You know, it's not such an art form today. Videos, I think it's kind of all been sort of done as it were. And um, I'm sure there's lots of uh, there's lots of chances to make great videos. It just um, it really depends on how much they're going to get played these days. You know, it really it, it's a difficult one. You know, at the end of the day, uh, you need to get the music played on the radio, and you need drive time, and that's what you need really. And um, as I say, it's really down to the song now more than ever. And people don't really buy albums anymore, as you know. They tend to download just the tracks they want. And hopefully they'll be able to do that with the, the videos as well, you know, download just the video you want and, you know, and you'll have the, the soundtrack as well. So I think that's where it's got to. The business has changed radically since we all started uh, doing this. Right, which you just uh, sort of alluded to before. You guys each recorded your parts separately. And even though a lot of bands did that in the studio separately back in the day, you know, in the analog era and everything, now with Pro Tools and digital and everything, Bands can be on different sides of the world and record an album. Um, how do you feel about that? Do you do you feel that in some way loses something or? Um, you know, you can't really fight technology. Um, you know, we couldn't fight the drum machines when they started coming in in the mid '80s, and everybody wanted to hear drum machines, and they suddenly mixed the drum machines so loud, much louder than they would ever mix a drummer, a real drummer. So it's all to do with fashion. It's all to do with the way people. Um, you know, want to sort of conduct their, you know, their status, their, the way they work and how they want to, you know, go about their creative force. And quite honestly, um, you know, we recorded all in the same studio, not at the same time. And yes, I could record my drums at home and say there's the versions and just fly them in and, and that would be it. Um, I personally think it's still nice to play in a studio and get the acoustic sound of the studio happening on an acoustic instrument like drums. Right. Yes, I've got a studio at home. Yes, it's a good sound. It's not as big a room as what I would like, and I'd rather be in a room that sounds really big to start off with, and then, you know, kind of treat the drums in that environment rather than just sending in a, you know, a simple sort of MP3 type of part from home. Um, I would rather go somewhere and, you know, go to work, as it were, rather than walk downstairs and walk into my studio and do two or three drum takes for everyone else to have a listen to and decide which ones we're going to stitch together or pro tool together. I'd rather actually go into the studio myself and work with an engineer and just get another point of view in there. I think it's always good. Well, before we get out of here, there's a couple things I wanted to ask you because you have had such a storied career. 
You're, yeah. you, I mean, you're clearly a legend as a drummer in, in rock and progressive music. Are there two or three highlights of your career that stand out the most for you? Um, I would say that um, the first highlight for me would be in the early 70s, 71, um, end of 71, beginning of 2, playing Madison Square Garden for the first time was a highlight. Not just because it was Madison Square Garden, but um, it was the beginning of the real climb artistically for the band. And I recall that being you know, a great, great moment. I would say that the Olympic Stadium in Montreal playing with the orchestra with 78,000 people there uh, back in the late 70s when we kind of wound up. Uh, the whole situation, I would say that was would be another highlight. And I would say being in Rochester, New York, in the early 80s, 81, when I was in the Crown Plaza Hotel, and I recall somebody coming down to the bar and telling us that uh, the album had just gone to number one, and that was Asia. And that was kind of a, a highlight for me. Saying that, probably, you know, the highlights for having number one albums and number one singles probably started in 1968 with The Crazy World of Arthur Brown and the song I Am the God of Hellfire, right. which not only was my first number one album and single, was also my very first trip to America. So I've had lots of highlights in my life. It's really hard to say there's one, two, three or four because I could talk for quite a long time on highlights. I've <laughs> had been blessed in that area. So then before we go, uh, the last couple of things here. Number one, was there a moment for you, whether it was an album, a performance, something that you saw that sort of was that epiphany moment for you that you said, this is what I want to do with my life? I think the, the actual light bulb went on for me when I was 11 years old and my, uh, my father had taken me to um, a movie theater to see a film um, and the film was the Gene Krupa story. Gene Krupa was a well-known drummer from the right. past. American uh, drummer from Chicago and um, the film actually in the UK was called Drum Crazy but it was known everywhere else obviously in America and around the world as the Gene Krupa story and I recall seeing that particular film one Sunday afternoon it was just my, my dad and myself and um, I remember walking out of the cinema and telling him that's what I want to do and um, that's really where I am and I want to do that right now and I've walked down that path ever since so that was I think we refer to it as a light bulb moment and that was it for me beautiful Carl Palmer of Asia Emerson Lake and Palmer the Carl Palmer band Atomic Rooster and so many other projects thanks so much for taking the time the new album is wonderful and we're looking okay. forward to seeing you when you get stateside okay great thanks for the interview take care brother bye. take care bye